fall. Um, this event is celebration of the publication in the UK by Edgehill University Press of this anthology, Atlantic Drift. What a good looking anthology. It, yeah. I wish I was in it. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> um, um, it, it was co-edited by the truly great uh, UK poet Robert Shepherd and James Byrne, who's sitting at the table right here. Um, the other invited guest to la launch Atlantic Drift, the anthology in the US, um, include Forrest Gander, who is sitting to James's right, Zoe Scolding, who comes to us from Bangor, Wales, um, and then Banu Kapil, who comes here from Colorado. There are copies of Atlantic Drift in the back of the room that will be for sale. There's a hard copy, um, hardcover, which will be for $20, which is significantly discounted from the price in the UK. Um, and the paperback is $15. And one of us, Leo Dusker, will be taking care of the sales. After the event, the, the way it's going to go is I'm going to give very brief, boring introductions for each of the, of the people here, basically reading you the bio notes from the anthology. Um, then James is going to come to the podium and say a few words about the anthology, the editing of the anthology, whatever he wants to talk about, and then read for a bit from his work. Um, after that, uh, uh, Banu Kapil will come and read, then Zoe Scolding, then I will read, and then Forrest Gander will be the headliner at the end. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to bring poets from the UK to campus at Berkeley. Um, Robert Haas, uh, Bob Haas, has very generously helped pay. Um, for some of the funding that was required to get them here and to put them up. Um, so thanks to Bob enormously for his generosity. Um, okay, so about James Byrne. He's poet, editor, translator, and senior lecturer at Edge Hill University. His most recent poetry, which is in Liverpool. His most recent poetry collections are Everything Broken Up Dances and White Coins. He is editor of The Wolf, and in 2012, co-translated and co-edited co -edited Bones Will Crow, 15 Contemporary Burmese Poets. He is also the co-editor of Voice Recognition, 21 Poets for the 21st Century, published by Blood Axe in 2009. And he's the international editor for art publications. His selected poems is coming out in Spanish in Spain uh, later this year. Um, someone characterized him today as the Ezra Pound of British letters without the fascism. Um, uh, uh, so we're very glad it's without the fascism. So I'm, so I'm British, so it's always tenuous. Yeah, I know, I know. Not far away. Banu Kapil was born in England, but now lives in the US, where she teaches at Naropa University and for Goddard College. She's the author to date of five books of poetry, The Vertical Interrogation of Strangers, Incubation, A Space for Monsters, Humanimal, A Project for Future Children, Schizophrenia, and Bon en, en Banlieue. She can be found on Twitter at this, at this Banu and maintains a widely read blog whose address I will not attempt to read aloud. Um, but since you're all going to buy a copy of Atlantic Drift, it's in there. <laughs> Zoe Scolding, who, as I said, comes from Bangor, uh, Wales, is director of the Creative Writing Program at Bangor University. Her main interests lie in sound and performance, ecopoetics and urban space, and translation as a creative practice. Much of her work has centered on how place shapes and is shaped by language. Poetry collection, the Museum of Disappearing Sounds, is concerned with what it means to listen to the world around us in its human and non-human aspects, as it explores the poem as a space of tension between music and noise. Scolding is collaborating with visual artist Ben Stammers on, is it R. Ada or Rada? Um, Rada. 
Prada, um, a poetry, photography, and performance project of the Ada, Bangor's little known Culverton River, which uh, we have a lot of underground rivers in Berkeley. Um, several of us have houses that are on underground rivers, and the, the basements flood when it rains, if it rains. Um, translation is another important area of Skoldig's practice-based research, with translations of the work of Luxembourgish poet Jean Portant into English. She also co-translated the American poet Jerome Rothenberg into French. I'm Lynn Virginian. I teach here at Berkeley. And Forrest Gander is a writer and translator with degrees in geology and English literature. His book, Core Samples from the World, published in 2011, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Other collections of poetry include I Against I, Torn Awake, and Science and Steeple Flower. Among his many translations are Fungus Skull, I Wing, Selected Poems of Al Alfonso Takino, and Alice Iris Red Horse, Poems by Yoshimasu Kozu. Gander's latest title is The Trace, a novel. Until recently, he taught at Brown University in Rhode Island. He has now moved across the country and lives in Petaluma. Um, so welcome, all of you. And James, if you'll take over. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hear me at the back? Thanks so much, Lynn. Um, you know, it's uh, really deeply moving to be in endorsed by poets you respect so highly. Uh, I think Lynn is uh, one of the great poets writing in the English language today. So thanks for inviting us. Thanks also to Bob Hass, catalyst in so many ways, catalyst figure, and, a, and a, definitely a catalyst in getting us here. Much appreciated, Bob. Uh, thanks to the Berkeley Faculty of English and also to Ed Chill University where I work. Um, and I also want to say to the poets Barnu, <coughs> Zoe and uh, Forrest, again, you know, to read with poets um, and to celebrate an anthology that they're all in, to be able to, to work with these poets is um, just a great bonus, you know, for all this work in terms of uh, writing and editing, to be here with you is um, such a great thing. Okay, so as Lynn said, I'm going to give some brief thoughts on Atlantic Drift, as it was before. I will hold it up just to show you. The hardback edition is resplendent, and um, it's 20 bucks. Okay, uh, so I think there's really, I mean, this is our US launch of Atlantic Drift. The book has been out almost a year now, and it was always, the ambition to come to the United States to um, to launch the book and to do that after a series of launches in the UK. And I think there's no better place to do this than at Berkeley. The reading series here is is legendary. I mean, I've been teaching, I'm looking at the video now and thinking, well, I've been teaching videos of other poets reading from Berkeley for as long as I've been teaching. So to be here to launch the book is very special. Uh, we're here to celebrate a book that publishes 24 poets from the US, from the UK, from Canada. Every contributor has a healthy selection of pages of poetry and also has contributed a poetics. The poetics is usually at the back of each poet's selection. Um, and some of these were, were easy decisions in a way. For example, Lynn Virginian's uh, Rejection of Closure. Again, I've been teaching that poet poetics uh, for a long time. Forest. Poetics, which is extraordinary, starts with uh, mine is a poetics of listening, um, and that's another text that I've been teaching for some time. And, th and in other cases, such as Barnu and Zoe, we, we commissioned new poetics, and they are, well, anthologists cannot pick favorites, but they are standout pieces in this volume. Uh, this anthology uh, explores the relationship between poetry and poetics, and many students at Berkeley, how many students do we have? I won't ask you to raise your hands, but um, I'm sure you know already what poetics is. You've got great teachers here. Um, but in this case, for Atlantic Drift, we wrote an introduction. I'm just going to give you a little short excerpt which neatly encases um, what 
poetics is for us. So Robert Shepard, my co-editor, said that poetics is essentially a speculative, writerly discourse on the creative process in general or on specific works as they are written. And this speculative nature um, involving the writing of a poetics rather than, say, the more programmatic or, or didactic nature of, say, the manifesto is really important to Atlantic Drift. Uh, we also wanted to reflect the pluralities of form that a poetics can take. So, for example, you have some pieces which are like thumbnail sketches, some that are more formal, almost like the manifesto, some that are more lit crit. Um, and we wanted, in some poetics, that are also poems themselves in their own right. So we wanted to embody and embrace all these forms, and you'll find them in the book. Um, some poets, like uh, Barnu or Claudia Rankine, who's included, have uh, selections of work which, in which statements of poetics can occur throughout the entire selection. And I found that really interesting editorially. Uh, there are a couple of anti-poetics, some coerced people to write poetics, even though it's not what they would necessarily do. Um, there was no force involved. Uh, we wanted to make a book that, that embraced all these forms. Um, for my part, and I think this is important, maybe it will come up in our discussion later on, um, I wanted to edit a book that dispelled the idea of, of there being a transatlantic divide, uh, particularly now in the, in the 21st century. There are poets who have, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic who have been in dialogue for decades. I think of someone like um, Denise Levitoff, say, a poet born in the United Kingdom, lived and worked in America, produced her work uh, here. I think of someone like Tom Rayworth, who's uh, a precursor to language poetry. All these things, I think, are really important, perhaps worth considering. Um, we also wanted to edit an anthology that collected innovative poets, rather than the usual suspects. Um, I'll go out on a limb here, I'll say that in, in England where I live, uh, it's as if mainstream poetry can operate like the movement that doesn't want to move anywhere, that wants to re retain its, uh, its space. And I think I'm wary also of, of um, the transatlantic exchange being affected by the literary corporatism of, uh, yeah, what I would call the literary corporatism of mainstream poetry. So we wanted to ex expand away from that. Lastly, um, extending the transatlantic dialogue means to celebrate the dialogic nature of what poetics is or what it can be. And I think this feels really important in times where, to use President Obama's phrase, demagogues last week, to, um, to think that um, rather than those who would rely on dividing society, on divisiveness, to actually think about a poetics which is open and dialogic and um, is social and communal in some way. So we include work that explores some of these elements and, and is something that I think is very much embodied by our, re our readers this evening. So as I've said, and it's the last time I'll say it, there are a few copies of, of the book available. I uh, hope you enjoy this event. I might be biased, but I think that we've got a really star quality, exceptional lineup uh, for this reading. And it's really humbling for me to be involved. So I'm really excited. Um, I have the pleasure to read the first poem tonight. And I'd like to read a poem by Chris McKay, poet born in 1977, lives in Liverpool, in the northwest of England. And, yeah, I'll read this one. This was written, uh, it's dated 7th of July 2005, which was the day of the, the bus attacks, the London terror attacks. So this poem is called Axis Is. Faceless threat of terrorism with still enough lips to eat. I ran to find your messages, mobile networks jammed. It was eating my carrier bags, a monster that can't be staked, soft accent of evil. But those were real human hands that touched the bus, 
five sticky fingers tap tap tank and a sucker of sweat. I went to buy a remote control. In one hand, she held a mobile phone. The other was in the bargain bin. James is okay, but he can't get home. I realized we hadn't spoken. A monster without a face, eating my bags as I ran, asking me as I walked. Axis is as Axis does. 52 people who left for work, names on credit cards, of no identity, at the hub of news and content, page 110 said, blasts won't shake UK economy. It's from Chris McCabe, great poet. One of the things that might come up later is, uh, you know, how to access some of the poets, like Chris McCabe published in, in the UK, and how do we actually get the books that he's published. I recommend you get the books he's published. One of the great poets of my own generation. So I'm going to move on. Lynn's asked me to read a couple of poems of my own. So, well, for me, getting here, actually, I'll be honest with you, it's a little nervy this time. And the reason for that is because I was going to come out to the US to see family. Uh, my wife has family in, in, in near, well, near LA and Ventura. Uh, but I was denied a visa to actually visit the United States. Um, so arriving here was a little bit nervy. Um, initially I was refused through the visa waiver program and I was at the airport and it was because I had visited Libya for a poetry festival in 2011. Um, what was reported as the, as the Muslim ban in the UK at least on the BBC and it made me think of that time when I was in Libya, where you know Gaddafi's face was still on the banknotes, um, though he had just been executed. And it made me think about this particular poem, where uh, we were traveling through an area called Sabratha, which is now, um, I'm not sure if it's still an ISIS stronghold, but it's certainly a very dangerous place to be. And the other thing to say about this is, we, went, we were taken up the mountain in, in, in the Nafusa, the Nafusa mountain, and we were given these huge clumps of herbs, and that's what I brought back for my wife, so this poem is dedicated for, to her. Wild desert time for Sandeep. For your sprigs of wild desert time, we convoy to the sea garden city of Sabratha, ghost walking Greco Roman walls, kitchen quarters, dungeons, the trembling concave of its amphitheater, gold as dusk, recasting the invisible chorus and back dropping away to the distant Maghreb, the cooled winter gulf where I dip my feet amid the rock scrub. Then afterwards, led through the white museum where my face sang in the glass house of the tragic actor and was neither healed nor lured by the attending liar of Bacchus or Concordia's matted scarf of serpents. I sat in the mosaic hall of the three graces smelling out the tarry bitterness of human meat. A daydream woken off by gunfire Another deferred wedding, hurried to the bus in a cloud rack of dust, to relative calm, the stricken village of Surman, brown limbs of shelled apartments, still wearing the massacre effect. Our creaturely sicknesses, old as Jupiter's beard tresses. Exact middle of the sun-burnished street, a hunched woman harries sacks of grain, our driver honks her to a fright, and she spills half the carry weight, and then turns to level back at us, hiding from under a black shawl, open and enormous in her silence. For your wild desert time, we take the checkpoint road beneath the Nafusa mountain, an old romantic route, straight as tightened rope. On one side, burst a hundred yard of camels, 
triumphantly riderless, and from the smeary west window all the way to the checkpoint, a scrapyard of tanks ditched in the roadside's gullet, their armaments plundered, overturned khaki bleeding bullet holes and scorched four by fours piled five high, potent as ash in the dust bath, in the chancelleries of war and hunger. The checkpoint soldiers of the Free Libya Army draw Kalashnikovs, nervous in a kind of antique fear, circling the vehicle at first until we pay them off with victory signs and Ashore's laugh of the honeybee. On the lassoing road of the mountain, welcome to Yefren, graffitied in English, Berber, and Arabic. Thank God for everyone's safety. Put up your head. You are free, Libya. Trucks on stilts, cracked gas pipes, and grey sprayed wheelbarrows outside the hardware shop where the shopkeeper taps his pen on the window grill and a boy fills a barrow with dead mortar shells. For your wild desert time, the Algazir rehoist their flag, rainbow of yellow, blue, red and green. The Algazir who have farmed this mountain for 800 years and who survived the war by living in ancient caves beneath the stone base of their ancient city. Gaddafi banned the al Qazir, burnt their flag, cut the food and water, says Salim, spiderishly nimble on the tumbled rocks, pointing to a road that does not meet, that has not met for 800 years. And it is from this road that I kneel down past the abandoned bootlegger path where the olive trees sing from the desert's hymn book and the caves hold a scent of the just-skinned carcass and the synagogue rises from a camouflage of sand. The taste of the future is history tethered inside this green box, a volcano of perfume, wind sculpted, embalmed with leaves like a tree. Open it. Thank you. What would happen if I sat here? Would it be okay? If I go to the podium, that's like going away, which I always do. What a rare experience to be in proximity to these other bodies. But if it's super annoying, I can... Okay. Like that? Yeah. Is that all right? Great. Yeah. Also, my heart is beating in my face. There's no reason for it, but there we have it. Vertigo, the heady, insuperable longing to fall, Milan Kundera. I knew that would come in useful. I wonder. I don't know why I'm nervous. Why am I trembling? Why am I here? I will read selections from this anthology organized by James. I haven't read from the anthology before, and so there will be um, asterisks, if that is a word. Um, between the various segments. Lynn, I put you entirely in charge of curtailing me if such a thing becomes necessary. I, I, I will take this responsibility. Thank you. <laughs> Where's the group? I hate the group. Where's the group? The day of the riot dawned bright and lazy with a giant silky cloud sloughing off above the roofs. The mouth of the riot was a stretch of road. It is so excruciating to write about these subjects that I take years, months, to write a sentence or two. The many earth and sea layers make me sick. 
In the scene for Ban, pink lightning fills the burrow like a graph. All day I graph the bandages, race passion, and chunks of dirt to Ban. Plant-like, she's stretching, then contracting on the ground. Three streets over, a mixed group near the house. Their faces are pressed to the blood-flecked window, banging their forehead on the glass. Inside the house, a woman arranges the meat on a tarp. She tucks and pins the shroud behind its ears with quick moving hands, looking up from time to time at the crowd that's gathered to watch. That night, I dream of exiting the subway at the interface a car would make with the M25. The commuters are processing around a semi-rural roundabout. Their hands on imaginary steering wheels, their wing back to loafers, shuffling on the tarmac, the black road like wheels, evening standards tucked sharply beneath their arms. The dream requires something of me. It requires me to acknowledge that my creature, Ban, is overwritten by a psychic history that is lucid, astringent, witty, no longer purely mine. Is one of my eyes fogged over on my yes. glasses? Yeah, I'm not, this is new, wearing the reading glasses. So I can see all of you. Hi, Rita. <laughs> Notes for Ban. I'm going to go like this slim if I can. Is that right? Just wasted 30 seconds there. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. What's happening? Notes for Ban. Ban fulfills the first criterion of monstrosity simply by degrading, by emitting bars of light from her teeth and nails when the rain sweeps over her, then back again. I like how the rain is indigo, like a tint that reveals the disease process in its inception. Above her, the pink lightning is branched, forked in five places. A brown ankle sparkles on the forest bed. Genital life gives way to bubbles, the notebook of a body's two eyes, are you sick and tired of running away? I pull myself up from my knees to clean. I clean the street until all that's left is a ring of oily foam, the formal barrier of a bad snow. It snows that April for a few minutes early in the day. Children walking on the Southall Broadway open their mouths to receive the aluminium snowflakes in their bright pink and chocolate brown dresses, tucked beneath their heavy navy blue coats, these immigrant children are dazzled by the snow, even though they were born here. A train ride from a city tilted to receive the light, its sprig bending over in the window of a bank. Many years later, I return to place a daffodil on the Uxbridge Road. Is zinc an element? It's a sheen. Spread it on the ankle of Ban. Is there a copper wire? Is there a groin? Make a mask for Ban. Copper notes for Ban. I want a literature that is not made of literature. A girl walks home in the first minutes of a race riot before it might even be called that. The sound of breaking glass is equidistant as happening, coming from the street and from her home. What loops the ivy asphalt glass girl combinations are braided as it goes, friction, concordance, I think too of the curved passing sound that has no fixed source. In a literature, what would happen to the girl? I write instead the tiniest increment of her failure to orient, to take another step and understand. She is collapsing to her knees, then to her side in a sovereign position. 
Mm. Notes for Ban 2012, a year of sacrifice and rupture, murderous roses blossoming in the gardens of immigrant families with money problems, citizens with a stash, and so on. Eat a petal and die. Die if you have to. See end date, serpent gate, hole. I myself swivel around and crouch at the slightest unexpected sound. When she turned her face to the ivy, I saw a bunch or cube of foil propped between the vines. Posture made a circuit from the ivy to her face. The London street, a tiny jungle, dark blue, slick, and shimmering a bit from the gold-brown tights she was wearing beneath her skirt. A girl stops walking and lies down on the street in the opening moments of a riot. Why? The fact of the riot decays around her prone form and at points it rains. In a novel that no one writes or thinks of writing, the rain falls in lines and dots upon her. In the loose genetics of what makes this street real, the freezing cold vibrating weather sweeping through southeast England at 4 p.m. on an April afternoon is very painful. Sometimes there is a day, and sometimes there is a day reduced to its symbolic elements. A cup of broken glass, <coughs> the Queen's portrait on a thin bronze coin, dosage, rain. This is why a raindrop indents the concrete with atomic intensity. This is why the dark green, glossy leaves of the ivy are so green, multiple kinds of green, as night falls on the skirt, the outskirts of London, Les Bonnieux. Then I could go on about King Henry VIII, some wild boar, and um, what happened at 11 p.m. that night. I could describe my own dress, my own muddy knees. But I think that's enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> which um, come from a, a sequence called Taint um, for the Bièvre, um, which is a, a lesser known Parisian river, um, not the really famous one, but one that was buried about a hundred years ago, culverted and then um, rebooted. Uh, it leaves a, a literary trace in the work of um, many writers, from uh, Rabelais to um, J.K. Wiesmans, who wrote about this river as being like an innocent little country girl who comes into the city and then is put to work in the uh, um, industrial quarters, the tanneries, um, and uh, the, yeah, the various sort of leatherworking uh, um, businesses, but also the, the famous Gobelin uh, tapestry factory. And uh, so I was, I was following following this this, this river. So, but, it's, but in terms of translation, um, which is an interest of, of mine, as was noted earlier, there are, there are bits of translation incorporated into the to, into the poems. I'm going to read some of that and then some from uh, a work in progress. Not a river, but its shadow harmonics, hidden level in the glass note, 
glissando between a movement and a sound, half in the performance where I ran to you, I ran as tainted water, while tarmac shines in rain, the channels you don't touch well up on tomorrow's tongue to flower there, don't leave, or was it this way that now I'll run from you? Not a beginning, but backwash hidden upstream. Industrial blood scrubbed clean away, chopped offal. The skins you didn't see stitched into the polis, rinsed into leather boots for wars fought in footsteps. If blood hangs in sight lines, reddening the mirrors, look away as water swallows every story. The city's vibrating skin, behind it, more skins. Not black ribbon, but white silences, deserted streets, a bleached dust under August moon, cool ermine traced with silver thread, shivers and scraped skins, say snow of leather or city drowned in feathers. You can't get far enough away to see the glacial picturesque without the ripped hide, stench and bloodstains seeping into utterance between the river and itself. Not a thread but a gut strung along arrondissements where the feeling is microbial love that passes understanding in our blue gentian candida, streptococcus, water lily, phage from everywhere at once. Why, this is Paris in the weather repeating itself, nor are we out of it, nor am I out of you, from secret to secretion, as water undoes us. Not a stream, but a laundry where the washer girls are ringing and beating and thumping the linen, rain running down their necks to the arch of the back, no longer smelling of amber and benzoin, says Wiesmans. The air that chokes them is fecal bass notes, overture of soap to animalic accord, a memory in the dry down of moss, earth harsh on the skin. Not channel, but waveform, in this arrangement still looping from the mouth and back, streaming, all ears, balance, tipped in its own labyrinth. How do you even say that when voice accumulates every river's accent? Children yelling in a cul-de-sac. You can't go back to where you came from, it already floods you. Echoes over high walls, rain pooling on tarmac. And um, so I'm going to um, continue with um, another sequence that came out of actually the same uh, period of a, a residency in, in Paris um, that was relatively short but uh, left me with a, a lot to work on afterwards. And uh, one, was, one, of the, one of those things was discovering the, uh, the Republican calendar um, and um, so in the French Revolution, when the Saints' Days were um, replaced with um, a, a, a decimal calendar of plants, animals, and agricultural instruments. And, um, and so I've been um, writing a sequence of poems, um, one for each of these um, objects or, or animals, plants, and, um, and thinking about various times of change, as was the, the period in which I've been writing this, uh, really since, since 2016, has been a very turbulent one in the UK, and um, yeah, not the kind of revolution we were hoping for. And, um, and so uh, it, it's been good to, to put myself into a different time and, and to think uh, from there. So today is the 24th of Fructidor, um, and its um, plant is sorghum, uh, but I'm actually going to read a bit of German art to finish off. Back to the spring. Primrose. First yellow, yes, but the very first rose of the first spring firsting a honeyed fist. 
plane tree. Bark peels off in patches, leaving a mottled trunk. Inside, spring pushes out new skins. All thickens and cracks. Asparagus. Sparrowgrass marks you green-scented, leaving its tang in your water. All this hurry into life, a lily stem. Tulip. Still life, never motionless, but fragile in wind, a turban unwound, how far a flower. Hen. Women are fragile on dating apps and difficult to monetize, he said, their golden eggs in a basket. Chard. Your stem a streak of gold and red on green, with this resilience you're holding on, holds out against the cuts. Birch. Here's a silver skin that peels away in layers against the pull of work. Hold tomorrow still while I rip yesterday from your back. Daffodil. In the rushes, running late on screens of inward eyes, this is yellow still trumpeting its own face multiplied. Older. Roundish leaves waved and toothed in late green days. Your underwater wood keeps the city afloat. Hatchery. Counting the days or counting the chickens. There you go, hatching tomorrows, where profit is nothing but your own broken shell. Periwinkle. Blue fetters, blue in ground cover, inching over nothing but its own shadow. Inside shell, a broken sky. Hornbeam. Iron wood blunts every blade that works it, while the slightest wind turns up the hidden moonside, charms your leaves to silver. Moral. Filigree holds air in the hollows, pushed out of earth, still hidden, but easy as breathing, never work. Beech tree. Everything seems to be hollowed out and falling apart, or is it falling together? tenderly encased. B. Reduced to function, workers suck honey from brioche. How to speak of hive together without queen, this is what stung you. Lettuce. Why, why, why are we sleeping? Suck this leaf with its milky juice, and sleep is an arrow, falling more slowly, shot into the future. Larch. First you don't see it, larch leaning into wind, a necessary lie, then you do. Hemlock. A drowsy numbness, clustered umbels, hollows, stems streaked red, laces the springs inaudible nightingales. Radish. The day was red to its swollen root, is that what you mean by radical? I tried to speak in this colour. Hive. Whose mind is whose? That was my idea. You stole it. Original honey pours over your profile. Judas tree. For prof profile, read outright lie or hidden seed. For blossom, read treason. Romaine lettuce. In the snap of a leaf, one sister, who said your time was your own, becomes another. Horse chestnut, an opening, not yet an opening, still varnished brown, spring in your fingers, stuck days. Rocket, the bitter leaves turn over as days turn into debts, cutting one loss after another. Pigeon. Strutting your losses in grey sky, feathered over this feeling of tarmac. Your agreement is taken as red. Lilac. An agreement of tense and colour blooms in the time it takes to read this. Anemone. 
Any monies made of blood or terminal bloom, gone with a change of wind, branching inflorescence. Pansy. Thought flickers behind a terminal, like the cost of your attention, gone branching, blood flow. Bilberry. The promise of so much spilled ink staining fingers, tongue, hands, when a flickering thought would have been almost enough. Grafting knife. Enough that the blade lifts bark from pith, levers the split, trims the cyan. If it takes, this is what it takes. that I contributed to um, the Atlantic Drift Anthology come from a extended sequence of poems that I wrote in the immediate wake of uh, the current presidents getting elected into the office he is mishandling currently. So I'm just going to read some of those. The title of the work is Time of Tyranny. Anxiety, ambition, energy, and sleep are caretaking fish in the deep black sea, my sweet, the black deep sea. Yes, and I tossed a twig, the XYZ of unrest and loss of privilege they never had, the vanquished Inca at the sharp angle of a perfect rainbow, and afterwards Jupiter appeared, of which the rocky mountains are like mules hauling oats, perceived by senses, words, a set of names, and music. All this should scare the legislators, noble and real, and we are crazy, and smell smoke for entertainment, social bonding, and great anxiety, that trinity of apricot, scalp musk, and gas of life, where light falls on the passenger seat, first upright and like a cornflower, but slow. I'm not too old to dance meadowlarks, great punctuation locks in black and blocks, crepuscular, and vein the sun in its descent. You kicked up dust, of which the Ural Mountains are but dim reminders through a wooded alley, loud as if disturbed in the unbuttoned fog that grays a pedestrian silhouette, while the passport picture reaching out to me is true or false to tetrahedral nation states dead in winter water, enzyme ice. I cannot fear to be forgotten, a child born, another book, the dust at dusk of skilled blind sculptors whose cities sink the swollen toad, her pride flamingos, lilies, and boy flowers, the center of a blue-black vault, an apron, history on it. Language is a victim of its own success, while into the carriage comes a louder lyric me, of which the coxcomb mountains are like apples, writing in the dust that none of us would be content to leave unlifted from a caterpillar's cud to chew. Poor tucks can kill, poor tanks and call. People are forced to live, work, yearn with bourgeois linearity to change this brake wielding life upon row upon row upon row of the river pulled further and further apart under the unswallowed elegy of a collared stork. Then productivity as reproductivity ends. Motion gets immobilized by perception into things perceptions get, but perceptions get it wrong from quantum habits of sadness, the hem of a sack wet under a hen. Doing is highly thought of and frequently abandoned, as at a bus stop beside a stunted ginkgo, and time is tossed a laundry pile large as the crown of a tree or the gravid animal of Pythagoras. 
and every mathematician dies while Reynolds vacillate or do nothing astrophysically speaking. Let's go for eggs and to the bakery. My kid wants to be a puppeteer. But someone must polish glass, and since then the refugees weep wax and travel over agate pastures and gag. But we have to trust philosophy and deny the property where depiction most perfectly depiction depicts. In a faux chateau of finance, the proposition is a picture of corn cakes, last crumbs, weapons passing from hand to hand. Let's rest. Life is fast. As a city rat, resuming says, rudeness is rude. What kind of ego would utter that demand? Every situation can be taken as subject to a proposition at stake at this stage of the state. Rejection of a context need not be of one's own hoeing of the sun, one's head a building site. Say I rode in on a vicious mule, surrounded by leaves under the northern star, the eternal conflict. Say I beat my brow and only put on shows, with withered webs, a rigmarole, an atrocity to which I'll give no words. I refuse it representation. The janitor is innocent, autumn is ill, and cruelty will be the rule until I die from a flea bite or while beating a metal drum, eating honey and corn like a girl again with an umbrella under a redwood, under a redwood tree with all of which I am in a certain sense one. The roof on trust of hover can't render love pathetic. I claim too much and yield to the big horn mountains of which the truth of history is but an indifferent silence. And then the last one. The foreman of the regimental puppet show hissed at me, and I could only hang my head, a gray stone, encircled by a band of white sedimentary stone, signaling, yes, that's it, stone signaling a day, the first of a future year mathematically proven by latching calcium onto a congruent cog over a 52-year period of war awaiting critique waged by the week, hour, minute, we forced to act, we forced to micturate, we forced to gadgetize, instantiate, frame, monetize, grade the cord, which takes us into a room left dangling by the puppet so that rain flow will not flaw the road along which orchards under shadows claiming distance controlled by the familiar near and domestic deer. I stop. Thank you. people that um, maybe are less well known to you and that were a turn on uh, for me when I got to read this anthology. So this is a poem by Sophie Collins who um, grew up in North Holland and now lives in Edinburgh. It's called Before and um, the, the word katun, um, K-H-A-T-U-N, is the female designated for like the mogul Khan. Before, in 1239, the mogul leader Batu Khan led his hordes in a full-scale invasion of Rus. His chief, Khatun Borachin, meanwhile, was at home, knee-deep in mutiny. The servants had, in the absence of the fearsome Khan, begun to rebel in small but unacceptable ways, making eye contact and addressing the cartoon directly, representing just two such misbehaviors in the stream of non-compliance that culminated in their spitting at her hair and body as she rose from bed. They had always despised her shallow breathing, pretentious, the pale crown of her head visible beneath an odd number of thin hairs 
sick, and permanently covered in beads of sweat, necessitating the near constant application of some powder of dubious origin, obenable. One late afternoon, after finding a pornographic etching on the inner lid of her family box, Borachin escaped the court unattended to the north gate, where she straddled an outsized stone turtle and picked at the uneven skin surrounding her left thumbnail, wondering at the politics of transmission, until she became so furious that she began to resemble a little white monkey. What followed was a long period of rain, a yearning for empirical consequence, an influx of anachronistic beetles escaping time. Somewhere in the present, a table of sisters became silent the moment their food was placed in front of them. Two trees were similar, but not the same. They were sister trees. At Fiat, a Fiat Panda carrying a team of cleaners with dark hair approached a Russian cathedral via a back road marked out by a low fence of dead reeds. Isn't that a great ending? Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, this is a poem by a poet. There's another uh, really fabulous uh, UK poet, um, kind of American UK poet in our audience, Sandy Parmar, in the front here, you should meet, um, who turned me on to a poet named D.S. Marriott, who uh, grew up in England. Uh, I think he's living in California now, right? Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. And, uh, and Sandy gave me his book, The Bloods. This is a poem of his called Else in Limbo. What's happening to me, I deserve it, as the pitiful emptiness descends once more, owing for the rent, sucking like a lost boy on the melancholy of fun fairs. A series of meaningless errands, the whole place gone quiet as penguins perform Shakespeare in a barn, a shooting gallery to layer the stillness Nobody hurt this time round, and you, you're just enjoying this improbable dignity of the word politics. Everyone waits for permission to enter the streets of the mind. We, Marxists, whatever today promises I deserve it, as the pitiful emptiness descends once more, I choose my moment to find a carcass in the woods, the smell pungent, the name of an unexpected gift in days handed over to the loud creaking of a directionless tiredness or the usual hope of a world worldling, worlding. But instead I drive slowly, careful not to upset the sirens and the ghosts. The wound is language. And um, one more poet uh, who is an American poet and who isn't getting out and about so much these days, um, but uh, whose work is really important to me and I was glad to find here, Rosemary Waldrop, and this is from The Lawn of Excluded Middle. When I say I believe that women have a soul and that its substance contains two carbon rings, the picture in the foreground makes it difficult to find its application back where the corridors get lost in ritual sacrifice and hidden bleeding. But the four points of the compass are equal on the lawn of the excluded middle, where full maturity of meaning takes time, the way you eat a fish morsel by morsel off the bone, something that can be held in the mouth deeply, like darkness by someone blind or the empty space I place at the center of each poem to allow penetration. All roads lead, but how does a sentence do it? Nothing seems hidden, but it goes by so fast when I should like to see it laid open to view, whether the engine resembles combustion so that the form becomes its own explanation. We've been taught to apply solar principles but must find our own where to look for Rome, the way words rally to the blanks between them, and thus augment the volume 
of their resonance. I wanted to settle down on a surface, a map perhaps, where my nearsightedness might help me see the facts, but grammar is deep, even though it only describes. It submerges the mind in a maelstrom without discernible bottom, the dimensions of possibles swirling over the fixed edge of nothingness, like looking into blue eyes all the way through to the blue sky without even a cloud bank or flock of birds to cling to. What are we searching behind the words as if a body of information could not also bruise? It is the skeleton that holds on longest to its native land. And I think I'll finish with a poem. I, I have uh, one book since uh, The Trace. It just came out. It's called Be With. And uh, I'll read one poem from it. Beckoned. At which point my grief sounds ricocheted outside of language something like a drifting swarm of bees. At which point in the tetric silence that followed, I was swarmed by those bees and lost consciousness. At which point there was no way out for me either. At which point I carried on in a semi-coma, dreaming I was awake, avoiding friends and puking, plucking stingers from my face and arms. At which point her voice was pinned to a backdrop of vaporous color. At which point the crane's bustles flared. At which point coming to, I knew I'd pay the whole flagpole fare. At which point the driver turned and said, it doesn't need to be your fault for it to break you. At which point without any lurching commencement, he began to play a vulture bone flute. At which point I grew old, and it was like ripping open the beehive with my hands again. At which point I conceived a realm more real than life. At which point there was at least some possibility, some possibility, in which I didn't believe of being with her once more. Thank you.